So I got as far as calculating the expression for, I think, the net electric field. And I had to let things uh, stop there. So, um, so I think, yeah, from there I just described, oh, given this, do you think you could calculate the intensity? So, so let me uh, finish up that lecture by um, calculating the expression for intensity. So, so I, I need to do a quick recap of some of the things that were done here so that uh, I'm not just uh, writing on screen here. So, so let me recap the um, what's covered in the lecture there first. And your textbook does do a version of this calculation and they use the phasers. And um, it's another one of those that uses the geometric reasoning, which is uh, in some ways intuitive, but it takes a great deal of creativity and thinking through what steps to follow. And um, it's, it, it's something that I've always found difficult. And the approach that I'm taking here with the use of complex exponentials, you are able to simply use algebra. Well, here actually calculus and algebra. And uh, so, so the calculus step is what you will or what you have seen me do in the lecture here. So I won't go through that in detail. Uh, but just to briefly recap what that is. So with a single solid diffraction, um, you treat the wave of front here at each point as being a source of the uh, electromagnetic wave. So with a single solid diffraction, uh, when you are looking at, okay, diffraction for light rays that are going at some particular angle, what you're considering is interference between all these uh, point sources of light. You assume that they all start out at some same common phase. And because of this path length difference at different <laughs> positions of the slit, you will uh, see an interference pattern that results from that. So what I have done in that calculation there, just to copy over the result is, um, I have the description of the phase shift that's gonna be a function of the, um, yeah, function of X is the position along the slit. So let me say X equals zero here and X equals A, the size of the slit. And the phase, this would be the expression for the phase shift at different points of the origin. That phase shift is equal to X times um, sine theta divided by lambda. So x times the sine theta gives you this length here at a particular position, dividing by lambda oh, and times two pi, <laughs> as I have it there. That, um, so this is the phase shift v as a function of position. Uh, I will need that. And um, to calculate the intensity, what you need to know is that intensity, um, it's a proportional to the electric field squared. There's a more precise expression where you can describe intensity as a uh, function of electric field with some coefficients and everything. Um, we don't need that for the purpose of this. All we really need to know is that it's proportional. So if I want to calculate on, um, so if I want to calculate intensity as a function of angle theta, because this angle theta will tell me where on the screen the light will end at, then all I need to do is uh, add up the electric field contribution from everything uh, as a function of theta. And uh, I guess the for the contribution portion itself is also as a function of this X here, saying which part of the slit it's coming from, add them all up. And in the process of adding it up, it won't be a function of X anymore. And adding it all up and then squaring it will give me a quantity that's gonna be proportional to the intensity. So I just need to uh, identify a portion that's gonna tell me that, oh, that's the I naught, that's the intensity we would have gotten without the 
the interference phenomena, and I can write this intensity as a function of that of hypothetical intensity or the average intensity. So what I've done in the lecture that you already have is I've worked out this because this is a continuous distribution. This is a summation thing actually becomes an integral. <laughs> That's uh, what you see me do there. And when you finish the integral, this is the result you have that the total electric field that you get. And this is the part that your textbook has to use the phasers to describe what the sum of all the optical electric fields will look like. And here I just use calculus, just do the exponential, find the antiderivative, evaluate it at the limit. And when you finish all that, this is what you get. That's equal to um, intensity. I think the way I defined E naught is, um, um, I think I'm missing uh, some symbol here. I'm trying to see, uh, I, I think I did a little bit of uh, notation abuse. Yeah. So <laughs> there is some step here that's not um, super kosher, but I think in the end, uh, the way I've written this in a here, that's the, um, that's the, the optical electric field you would have had, yeah, the units don't quite, <laughs> oh wait, if the units don't match up, then I do have an issue. Um, yeah, okay, uh, I there's a problem here that I need to fix. So um, the part about units not matching up is um, if I'm, okay, so let me just uh, write here what the correction would be. And I'll write the version with the correction. So um, I think there's a slight bit of a mistake there, which is that, um, so I'm trying to write down this, uh, um, write down this small contribution to the total electric field here. And in writing out this integral, I've written this out as the E naught. And I think E naught is meant to be um, the uh, E naught would be, let's say at the center where everything is in phase. Uh, no, so E naught is meant to be the uh, E average or uh, without interference. And if I have E naught times dx and I integrate over different values of x, then uh, that doesn't give me something with something that's quantity of electric field. That gives me a quantity of electric field, field times length. That's what this dx is. So what this uh, uh, coefficient here really should be is uh, some kind of electric field density. So what this really should be is E naught divided by A um, so that I'm acknowledging that I'm contri taking contribution for, um, so this has to be some kind of a density so that when I multiply to DX, I'm getting a portion uh, of the electric field contribution that's attributed to attributable to this uh, DX and so, and I when I add them all up, then I get what I should get. So there's a missing factor of A there. So let me carry that through. There should be A here and there should be A here. Um, and that'll make the units come out right. I have a unit of electric field from here and everything here is something that uh, cancels out to a unitless quantity. So <laughs> let me make the correction just to, on the fly here and uh, write down the version of the total electric field that has the correct factors. So it's uh, E naught times E to the I omega T times lambda over, um, let me put A in some place. Uh, well, I'll put A here, A times I two pi sine theta times and 
So I have parenthesis e to the i, I think that's two pi, two pi over lambda times a sine theta minus one. Okay, so that's the, uh, this is the total electric field. Um, that's what this is there. So what I want to do now is I want to finish up the calculation, derive an expression for the intensity, compare that to the formula that's in the textbook. And so this is the derivation that doesn't require any use of ge explicit geometric reasoning, just to, uh, as long as you watch the units and set up the integral correctly, uh, let you finish the calculation with just a simple calculus and algebra. So, so starting from here, what I want to calculate is the um, is this. So now, one thing that I will bring in is so here you see that the electric field is a function of time, and your intensity um, technically would be a function of theta at what angle it's going, and it would be a function of time in the strict uh, strict terms. But especially with the light, um, instantaneous intensity is something that we are very seldom interested in. We are usually interested in the average intensity, averaged over time, and it'll still be a function of theta. So, um, so, which is a for fortunate because instead of, if we are interested in the square of this, then given a complex representation, I think I have a lecture somewhere about how you can square this and expect to get the things right. But in the limited case, when your function, this complex function of time is an oscillatory function of time, and all you're interested in is the time average, the quantity, then I can use this special expression that, that this time average the quantity will be equal to, uh, or I guess what I really should write down is, um, so if I have electric field as a function of time, and what I'm really interested in is not just a square, but this is square uh, or averaged over time, then this can be, simply expressed in terms of this complex function as the, the complex conjugate of the function times the complex function divided by two. Uh, when you work this out, you are going to get an expression that doesn't depend on time anymore. And this will be the, uh, the time average the, of um, E squared. So, so I'm gonna do the calculation. I have this expression for E total, let me uh, calculate the time average of that. So, so I will have uh, time average, average over time <laughs> of um, E as a function of time times E as a function of time to itself. So that's gonna be, it, with the, the use of this relationship in mind, it's gonna be the complex conjugate of the function times the function itself. So let me write this out. This is the function that I first have to take the complex conjugate of. So uh, let me write down the complex conjugate of this function here. So it's uh, E naught times E to the minus I omega T uh, times lambda over A times, oh, I have I there, so minus i uh, times two pi times the sine theta. I still have this. Uh, I need a complex conjugate of that. E to the minus i two pi over lambda a sine theta minus one times the function itself. And the function itself is uh, e naught times e to the i omega t times lambda over a i uh, two pi sine theta times e to the i two pi over lambda a sine 
theta minus one. All right, uh, I'm just staring at those symbols to see what will cancel out. I think I see this canceling out this. So let me cancel them. Um, and the, I guess I'll collect the coefficient in front first. And then let me try to work out these two products. So the coefficient in front is going to be E naught squared times lambda squared divided by oh um, a squared oh minus i times i is one so the i have, don't have any minus sign so i have a squared times two pi squared times uh, sine squared theta all right i got that times and I have this uh, complicated looking product. Uh, let me expand it out and see, see what I get. Maybe it'll simplify somewhat. So I have um, the first term times the first term. It's one because it's the same exponent except with the different signs. So I have one. And the second term times the second term is plus one. So, okay, plus one. And I have the cross terms. Uh, this times the second one. So that's going to be minus e to the i um, two pi over lambda a sine theta uh, and the second term times the first one oh that's another minus minus oh wait, wait sorry the first one i forgot about this minus sign so there's a minus sign there the second term is just going to be minus e to the i two pi over lambda a sine Theta. Oh, I, I think I see some simplifications. So this reminds me of uh, something I've written before, which is that a cosine of theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two. So if I imagine factoring out minus one from both terms, then this is what I have. So this combination of terms here, that's very close to this uh, cosine expression. So I can actually rewrite this into uh, something that involves cosine. I think it's gonna be two times cosine of this parameter here, two pi uh, over lambda times a sine theta. Okay, that's getting somewhere. So, so this is, um, let me, I, I think uh, I'm close to the end here. Um, let me write down the final simplified version here. It's gonna be um, E naught squared lambda squared over, I um, feel like there's some, uh, uh, let me keep it this way for now. I have a uh, two pi squared times a squared the sine squared theta. And I have this two thing here. So let me pull that up. Two times one minus cosine of two pi over lambda a sine theta. Okay, uh, let's just do a quick um, quick sanity check. One thing I want to make sure that this expression does is I want to make sure that when theta goes to zero, this expression will be at a maximum. Uh, so when theta goes to zero, oh, I think uh, we might be better off with trying to simplify this further because uh, when theta goes to zero, I think I have zero over zero and uh, I, I don't want to have to deal with the L'Hopital's rules and whatnot. Um, I could have simplified. I, I think uh, there's a power raising formula. So uh, from this, you can get that sine squared theta is equal to one minus cosine of two theta over two. 
So this is one of the trig identities that allows you to trade a double angle with a, a raised power. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to identify this as my theta, quote unquote. With that identification, I can rewrite um, this quantity here as um, sine squared of this uh, theta times two. I think that's what that is. So can rewrite this as uh, two times sine square of um, this thing, pi a over lambda, and there's a nested sign. I'm not gonna be able to get, get rid of that. Sine theta. Okay, so um, so that lets me simplify a little bit and I can just uh, finish writing this down. I got a lot of factors of two. So let me cancel out some of them. Uh, I have two times that two there and I have two squared. So they will all cancel out and leave me with E naught squared lambda squared over um, pi squared, a squared, sine squared theta. And I think this is where you kind of begin to recognize some common term here. And if I look up the textbook formula, I'm pretty sure this is the one that they label beta. So, um, <laughs> so let me use that and just to write out, I have e naught squared times uh, sine squared beta divided by divided by uh, beta squared. So, so this is the um, this is the uh, uh, derivation that you end with uh, going through the consideration of a single solid diffraction. Um, using the complex exponentials. And uh, so this is the formula we end with. Uh, let's compare that with what your uh, textbook says, uh, see if we are close. <laughs> um, let's see here. Yeah, so this is the beta that we defined, uh, pi times a over lambda times the sine theta, where the theta is defined the same way we defined it. It's the angle at which uh, theta is, oh, they don't have a figure. It's at the angle at which the light is going. So it's the same theta that we, I represented here. And when they work out the intensity, they have this uh, I naught. So we identify that with this E naught squared here. That's uh, gonna be our intensity at the central maximum. And uh, I have the sine beta squared divided by beta squared. So, so this is the derivation. And I will show something using this uh, formalism uh, next week when we are dealing with the n solid interference. And it's, um, um, it's easier. It, it, in some sense, it's uh, uh, simpler to do with uh, these uh, complex exponentials. So um, yeah, so let me end it there. This again took a little bit longer than I uh, what you need to take. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so this is the alternate uh, presentation from how your textbook does it. And, and at the core, the phasor diagram approach that your textbook uses and what this uh, complex exponential representation really means uh, at the back end uh, behind the the, just the veneer of the algebra is that uh, all these geometric ideas that uh, presented here, that is included here. That's uh, what you will see when you, when you understand the connection between the, the, between the complex numbers and how we represent oscillatory phenomena. So 